Hello and welcome uh, to uh, today's presentation on multi-scenario, multi-realization, seismic inversion or probabilistic reservoir characterization. Today uh, I'll provide an introduction uh, on the method that we're referring to. What is multi-scenario inversion? Uh, why is it uh, important? We'll look at some of the challenges in seismic quantitative reservoir characterization before introducing uh, an overview of the FACES-based inversion scheme uh, that we'll be utilizing. We'll then demonstrate how this uh, inversion scheme works on a real-world uh, case study um, before summarizing uh, the results of the PowerPoint and the, and the case study with some conclusions at the end. So I think it's widely uh, accepted that, you know, and, and, and adopted um, Inversion is used as one of the primary means of identifying changes in rock properties between uh, well locations. Most of the algorithms today, of course, uh, use a, what's referred to as a, a low frequency model. Um, the low frequency model provides the first starting guess for, for most uh, inversion algorithms. And very typically, uh, those models are constructed from well data um, and the well data are very often sort of interpolated or extrapolated uh, from, from their, their uh, uh, geographical locations using geostatistical estimation algorithms such as Krieging, co-located co-Krieging, uh, and so on. And very often what you find is that um, uh, 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 <clears throat> the uh, person running the inversion will come up with their best and favorite uh, low frequency model and run the inversion and then try to address uh, uncertainty um, through some of the post-processing flows such as uh, Bayesian classification. Um, however, in doing that, um, some of the, the more significant, you know, higher order uncertainties uh, can be overlooked. So what we propose uh, in this uh, presentation is a tiered inversion workflow um, through which you know, some of those, those bigger um, higher order uncertainties can be um, addressed. So if we look at the overall process of, of quantitative reservoir characterization, um, it's, it's typically a sort of uh, two-step process. So we start with our seismic data uh, and some form of low frequency model which has been constructed through the combination of wells and, and perhaps other uh, data. And the inversion algorithm is then run and that algorithm will typically output um, P wave, S wave and density cubes. So the three elastic properties that, that, that we're very familiar with working with in the rock physics domain. Once you have those properties, the next step is, is to somehow convert them or invert them back to um, petrophysical properties, which are the things that, you know, as geologists, as geoscientists, we're really most in, interested in. So what's the porosity? What's the actual rock volume? How much of that rock volume is filled with uh, hydrocarbons? Uh, and what is the in-place volume? Uh, and where should we drill uh, our next well? So the two key steps of the uh, reservoir characterization process are the rock physics and the simultaneous inversion. But uncertainty comes into the mix in all sorts of different uh, places. We have, uh, you know, the challenge of seismic bandwidth. It might be that we're working with seismic data which have only a limited angle range. It might be that the data that you're working with uh, are required in uh, areas where you suffer from significant noise or where there are significant overlaps uh, in the rock properties. And of course, there are any multitude of other uh, challenges, challenges and issues such as uh, you know, anisotropy and uh, uh, dispersion and, and other uh, shallow uh, artifacts that might creep in. So we'll have a look at a couple of those in a bit more detail. So seismic, are, uh, seismic data are, of course, uh, band limited um, in nature. And that means that they're missing uh, the low frequencies. And because those low frequencies are missing, 
it means that we can't directly get to absolute values from the seismic data. We can't establish or, or develop trends uh, from the data. Uh, it means that there is significant tuning present in the data from constructive interference uh, across different uh, geological interfaces. Uh, and of course, that means that there's significant ambiguity uh, in the uh, amplitude responses and the reflection responses that we're looking at. One solution to that is, of course, that we could construct a low frequency model and that could come from wells, it could come from seismic velocities, it might come from a sort of interpretation type process. But the question is, how are we going to do that? How are we going to build that model? And how many of those models should we build? Should we build more than one? So if we look at that in a little bit more detail, particularly at the low frequency uh, part of, of the problem. Well, fundamentally, you know, the seismic data are independent of the uh, low frequency model. Lots of different low frequency models can ultimately give the same seismic response. So knowing that, of course, one would say that uh, you have to create lots of different low frequency models to try to capture and understand uh, the range of plausible outcomes uh, that, that, that one might expect. If we look at the plot on the right hand side, <clears throat> I have three sets of acoustic impedance and VPVS uh, traces, colored red, blue and green. The red curve, of course, uh, everything is offset to lower uh, impedances. So in absolute terms, if this was a, a sandstone layer and we had a very low uh, impedance, well, that could either be a, a, a gas bearing sort of normal porosity type sand, or it could just be a very high porosity sand. Uh, for the green case, <clears throat> equally, it could be a, 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 a gas bearing sand uh, and it could be a high porosity sand. But the, the absolute porosity of the green versus the red would be quite different. Yet when uh, reflection coefficients are generated from these three different models, they produce synthetic seismic responses which are identical. You cannot differentiate between these three models given that pre-stack gather and therefore either the high or low porosity case that corresponds to those impedance profiles could be valid. If we were to build a model entirely from uh, the interpolation of well data, um, very often what you'll find is that it just simply doesn't produce geologically reasonable results. What we end up with is a elastic model, which is a reflection of the well geometry, not of the geology. If we try to adopt uh, an interpretive approach to uh, building the low frequency model, where we start with the seismic data, we perform a relative inversion, we apply thresholds and a classification process to place different geo bodies in 3D space and then assign elastic properties to those geo bodies. We can do a pretty good job of, of, of developing and uh, creating a, a laterally and vertically complex um, low frequency model, but there are always limitations depending on the bandwidth of the data. There will be limitations as to how thin we can uh, create um, layers in that model. But there will also be limitations as to how thick uh, those layers are that, that can be, be created through that iterative process. So regardless of how good the model is that we build during that process, there will always be areas of deficiency such that comparison of the sort of inversion of the data using a true background model versus what you can get from uh, an iterative type model still results in areas of, of missing frequencies and ultimately that translates into errors in rock property estimates like porosity and saturation. And then lastly, um, you know, if we wanted to use seismic velocities to build the background model, um, there are all sorts of uh, challenges in doing that. Firstly, uh, they require calibration. And from one well to the next, they'll typically require a slightly different calibration factor. So how do we distribute those calibration factors 
in 3D? What if you only have a very short sequence of uh, log data? How certain are you that, that that calibration at that location is is uh, is good? We also have to somehow convert the P wave velocities to a corresponding S wave and density. But of course, that uh, that conversion uh, is not straightforward. In fact, because you're dealing with uh, data at such low frequency, the relationship to transform S P, to P wave to S wave will vary as a function of the geological layer thickness across the survey area. So fundamentally, uh, you can't really do that to any uh, decent degree of accuracy. And then lastly, of course, very often what you'll find is that the frequency content of the seismic velocities is extremely low, perhaps only two or three hertz for a conventional uh, processing uh, job. So only in cases where you have um, high frequency uh, FWI that gives you uh, a velocity model that goes up to perhaps 15, uh, maybe even 20 hertz, um, does that become a, a, a sort of plausible reality? Or whether you have broadband data where the uh, frequencies in the reflectivity data might get down to a few um, hertz um, or so. But regardless of that, you still have the problem of what are the calibration factors and uh, how on earth do you transform from P to S wave and density? There are also missing high frequencies and the problems with high frequencies mean that uh, you have reduced resolution, you have ambiguity, again, lots of different high frequency uh, variability will give exactly the same seismic response uh, because it's outside of the bandwidth of the, uh, the seismic data. Uh, and ultimately you have a lack of detail. So again, what are the solutions? Well, we could put some constraints in, or we could model the detail, uh, and we would have to model that in a stochastic manner uh, to, to understand the sort of range or full range of uh, possible variations. High frequency variations ultimately can give rise to exactly the same seismic response. So on the right hand side, I've got a, a well here, uh, with the low frequency content um, uh, displayed for VPVS and density in tracks uh, two uh, to five. Now, what we've also done is to bring over uh, the low frequencies from a neighboring well. We've then separated out the high frequencies uh, from, from um, uh, these wells which we can then sort of transpose back onto the different low frequency uh, models. Now, ultimately, here we have um, my elastic absolute properties um, in, in the last three uh, uh, curve uh, tracks, sort of middle, middle uh, right of the uh, upper right image. Both of those sets of elastic logs have different high frequency uh, components. But the synthetic that's generated from that, the pre-stack synthetic uh, that's generated, has no, almost no difference um, between the two cases. And that's shown with the difference filled uh, gather in the last track on the right hand side. In terms of resolution, um, of course, we can, we can um, model this using our uh, trusty uh, tuning wedge and we can apply um, you know, phase rotation uh, to get to quadrature, or, or we can cal calculate quadrature phase and look at the relative impedance uh, version of the reflectivity model. And of course, as we decrease um, the upper frequencies, then we will see that our ability to resolve layers uh, directly from the amplitude data will diminish. Um, and there are uh, uh, numerous uh, papers out there on that particular process. We could um, also model some of the detail, um, so we could do geostatistical simulations. So that's one of the fundamental principles of um, you know, geostatistical inversion and stochastic inversion. Um, but of course, um, whilst we have that detail, there are many, many different models which would have, have different detail, which would also produce the same result. So we use this as a, as a tool to help us understand uncertainties um, and 
and uh, to uh, guide the way that we interpret uh, lateral changes of things that are sub-seismic uh, in, in field development scenarios. And we can also introduce uh, constraints. So um, if we have noisy uh, data, for example, um, if we were to impose a lateral constraint during an inversion process, then it would allow us to promote connectivity uh, and actually promote uh, the detection of uh, thin layers. And indeed, that's one of the uh, benefits of, of, uh, of adopting uh, faces-based inversion uh, techniques that have uh, these types of lateral constraints built in. So we should probably be building um, more than one low frequency model, as I alluded to uh, in an earlier slide. And one way to do that is using this sort of iterative um, uh, inversion approach. Left hand side, we have a seismic data set. We have its corresponding relative impedance. And what we might do is to assign thresholds to the relative impedance cube to help us position tops and bases of certain layers. So that's the middle low frequency model uh, that's shown here. But we would also build alternative versions. Maybe we would interpolate the wells. Maybe we would uh, position the contacts differently between certain models. Um, maybe we would use a model that combines seismic velocities with well data. Maybe we would use the seismic velocities directly. Ultimately, for every model you build, you will end up with another inversion instead of uh, elastic properties and perhaps a, 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 another set of faces images. And once we have all of those, we can start to do some uncertainty analysis. So we might calculate the average net porosity thickness across all of the realizations or, or scenarios that we've built. And once we have the average, we can look at the uh, percentage deviations uh, from that average uh, to get a feel for what areas have high uncertainty, what areas have uh, lower uncertainty. So to summarize, we've got all sorts of issues um, uh, around uncertainty in the reservoir characterization process. Seismic bandwidth, angle range, for example, if you have a limited angle range, the uh, uncertainty in VPVS estimates will be greater than if you have a, a larger uh, 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 angle range. Noise and rock property overlap, so there are always going to be limitations in certain geological settings that, that mean that uh, you won't be able to detect uh, very thin layers. But, and there are all sorts of other issues such as the quality, general quality of the data, anisotropy, frequency variations, software and, and algorithms uh, will give different results. And of course the, the experience of the user that's actually running uh, the, um, the software itself. So whilst there are many different sources of uncertainty, probably the one that has one of the largest impacts on the quantitative interpretation process is the low frequency model uh, itself. The sort of conventional approach to, to this um, requires that you have to build lots and lots of different low frequency models uh, in order to really uh, capture and understand the uh, possible uncertainty. And effectively what you're doing is, is you are deliberately biasing the result um, to reflect a range of uh, prior geological uh, knowledge and assumptions that, that, that you might have made. That actually requires significant expertise and as a result, very often it doesn't get done. So what we wanted to do was, was to come up with a, a sort of technique, a workflow, that would help to reduce uh, some of the bias arising from low frequency modeling uh, and to improve the efficiency and, and ultimately reduce the cycle time to generate this improved understanding of uncertainty uh, in, in, in the subsurface. So the inversion scheme um, that we've come up with um, is, is what we refer to as a multi-scenario, multi-realization um, approach. This is based on the faces-based inversion scheme uh, published first in 2014 by uh, Michelle Kemper and James Gunning. Uh, 
So what are the inputs? We start with our seismic pre-stack data. We have velocity information. We have wavelets for each angle stack. And we have signal noise estimates for each angle stack. We have a structural framework. And we have zones which have been created within that structural framework and populated with prior estimates of the abundances of different rock types. And these prior abundances um, are actually very uh, from one scenario to the next. And then lastly, we have the elastic property inputs, which are of the form of uh, velocity compaction trends and P to S and P to density uh, uh, rock physics relationships that allow us to uh, establish and visualize the uh, PDF uh, for each of the rock types in, a, in any form of elastic space. So we take all of the inputs and now by some simple tweaking of the input uh, prior proportion models, we can start generating different scenarios. So it may be that we have one scenario that we make an assumption that, that, that we're dealing with a 50% net to gross system. Another scenario where we say, well, perhaps it's only 20% and another where perhaps we say it's 80%. We might run a scenario where we introduce a completely new facies type. We might run a, 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 a different scenario where we have a completely different geological play concept with, with totally different facies types. All of these different combinations uh, will have some corresponding fit to the data, which we can then assess, uh, interpret and analyze before going forwards into the stochastic uh, part of the workflow, where for each scenario we generate multiple realizations. Once we have all of these realizations, we can start to perform statistical analysis to come up with things like um, ranking, which, which of these cubes give me, gives me the highest GRV, uh, the greatest volume of, uh, in place, uh, oil or gas? Uh, how is the pay thickness distributed? What does it look like at different probability levels? And how do those geo bodies vary? And how do we plan uh, future well locations to intersect uh, the best locations across the field. So a quick overview of the FACES scheme, FACES inversion scheme, and some of the key benefits. So it doesn't require a conventional low frequency model, and therefore we're removing some of that sort of bias that's built into those types of models. Instead, we let, we let the geologists and the geophysicists pick different ranges of plausible um, geological parameters like net to gross or like a different place setting. Um, we can then smooth and change the stratigraphic relationships um, and we can, we can uh, do that to incorporate things like uncertainty in the picking of seismic uh, horizons. The inversion is, is mixed, uh, discrete uh, and continuous and it's exploiting uh, the signal to noise between faces classes. So where we have big separation between different rock property types, uh, that will actually drive a lot more uh, resolution and detection from uh, the seismic data, regardless of the seismic data uh, bandwidth. Um, broad ranges of different geological models can be tested. So very often, um, what you will find is that uh, quite early in an exploration process, uh, uh, your team may set, settle on a particular geological model, and all of the focus and emphasis will be, will be, will be tuned towards uh, developing that geological model uh, and, and everything that, that, that comes out of it. <clears throat> what tends to get ignored is that there may be another perfectly plausible geological model that would also honour that same data. There will also be a range of other geological models that don't fit that data, uh, but they may still be geologically pl plausible. So it gives you that framework to actually start testing different success and failure cases, and that becomes particularly important um, in both, uh, well, particularly in front of front frontier uh, exploration, but also in production settings where uh, you're, you're looking at uh, slightly more granular differences between uh, the geological scenarios uh, in the presence of a lot more knowledge. And of course, 
you have these faces based uh, compaction trends. So you're guaranteed consistency in the rock physics through the inversion and interpretation workflow. The algorithm we're using in this particular case is referred to as IQP, which stands for Integer Quadratic Programming. It's a, <clears throat> a, a, a form of uh, simulated um, annealing, and it's based on extensive research which has been performed uh, collaboratively between uh, Icon Science and CSIRO, uh, or the Commonwealth Scientific Industrial Research Organization uh, based out of Australia. And at the bottom of this uh, slide, I'm showing um, some snapshots of uh, the simulated annealing process on the data set that we're applying it to. And what you see is that step one is a random uh, distribution of, of, of faces pixels. And as the inversion uh, progresses, um, it will start to, to hone in on areas uh, where certain faces uh, and lateral and vertical combinations of those faces are more likely uh, than other locations. It's a global inversion, so it's inverting uh, the entire data set in one go. Um, and so what comes out are, um, are, are, are the best possible uh, global solutions uh, for the data and input parameters that have been provided. So in terms of um, <clears throat> The case study we're going to focus on to the 40s field in the UK and we want to assess the hydrocarbon probabilities uh, from this multi-scenario multi-realization inversion approach. So there are a couple of different sources of uncertainty uh, in, in this uh, process. We have what we call a parameter space uncertainty. So that would be things like how many zones are we going to use? Um, all of their stratigraphic relationships, including things like the positioning of fluid contacts. How many faces should we use? What are the prior proportions of the faces within each zone? How much smoothing do we apply uh, to, those, uh, uh, to those zone boundaries? And then, of course, you have the data uncertainty itself. So uh, what is the um, standard deviation of the fit uh, to the P wave velocities? What are the standard deviations of the P to S and P to density transforms? What's the uh, depth uncertainty on the time depth velocities? What are the noise levels in the seismic uh, and the associated uh, uh, wavelets and so on and so forth? So all of these things are contributing to the ultimate uncertainty and we would like to explore uh, ranges on these parameters uh, during any uh, sort of inversion process. So we took the five angle stacks um, and the four uh, faces uh, categories that were defined as part of this project. And we used those to um, generate 14 different scenarios. And for each of those scenarios, we generated five realizations. That gives us in total a uh, uh, 70 um, uh, output volumes, which we can then analyze to start to look at uh, probabilities and uncertainties. So the two images below show two of the sort of key wells uh, across the field uh, area. And <clears throat> you can hopefully see that uh, we have two tracks labeled AI and velocity or velocity ratio. And then in a central track, um, we have a, a sort of uh, uh, the posterior um, uh, proportions uh, of each of the faces classes that have come from the inversion. And then we have uh, for QC, uh, the in situ gather and the uh, actual seismic uh, gather. So you can see that by no means are these seismic data um, you know, very high quality. They, they, are, they are good data, but they are fairly typical of, of um, what, what you would find in, in many North Sea type reservoirs. So we have 70 different elastic property realizations, and we can now see the spread in elastic properties relative to the mean curve, which is shown in black. And what you'll see is, uh, in general, um, modest spread in the uncertainties of the elastic properties, but 
where we do see significant fluctuations and variations are close to the major geological boundaries. And that's no surprise because uh, there are lots of different uh, possible combinations of elastic properties that honour the seismic data to within the same uh, sort of degree, um, particularly where we have uh, the convergence of uh, elastic properties, in this case, acoustic impedance of the um, uh, reservoir when it's oil bearing uh, is, of course, closer to the shale properties, um, uh, close to those boundaries. So inherently more uncertainty in uh, some of those properties. So here we have, um, I have my 14 scenarios. Uh, to generate the scenarios, we've modified the oil proportions, the trends, uh, and some of the trend errors. And the inversion is run. And then to generate each of the realizations, um, it's essentially doing Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling um, uh, on each of the uh, posterior PDFs that are generated for each of the scenarios. On the right hand side, I have a FACES image from one of those randomly selected scenarios. And if I click on the mouse button, we'll get a short uh, animation um, across 14 of those different uh, generated volumes. If I step back and we now focus onto the crestal position of the field, we can see that the starting realization here um, shows quite a strong uh, or low net gross um, uh, result. As we look through certain other realizations, we see that actually there are some results which show that we could actually have decent connected pay across that portion of the field. Looking down the flank to the left hand side, we can see that there are some realizations that would suggest that we might have risk of disconnected pay uh, from the down dip flank of the field um, relating to pinch out of some of the geology in that, uh, uh, some of the reservoirs in that area. Equally, we have other volumes that are, are, are well connected. How many of each? Uh, that's something that we can actually count. If we look at this central area between the two wells, and we look across all of the realizations, what we see is that regardless of all of the changes in the input parameters that we've made, the result is always the same. So that's telling you something about the data, it's telling you something about the geology at that location, and it's telling you something about the uncertainty in the results. For every single one of these uh, FACES models, we also have a corresponding elastic pro uh, uh, set of elastic properties and uh, of course, one of those is, uh, or, or can be, or they can be visualized as uh, the low frequency models. So if we perform that same cycle, so these are all the same corresponding um, randomly selected uh, cubes, we can start to see how much variability there is in the low frequencies. And of course, these low frequencies are being generated from the combination, the vertical configuration of uh, faces cubes. So in some areas, you see that we get a very thick vertical succession of, of uh, predominantly sand. In other areas, we get a vertical succession of predominantly shale. So there are natural lateral variations which are driven from the amplitudes, uh, which are, can be driven from the velocity model if you provide it, um, but that fundamentally give lower frequency information from the seismic than the natural bandwidth of the seismic data um, itself. And we can see for sure there are areas where there are significant changes in the low frequencies, which will translate into significant uncertainties in the elastic uh, and rock property um, estimates. So what we've done is to then take all of those realizations and calculate the most likely facies, the oil probability, and then I've taken four randomly selected facies uh, realizations. We can see um, on the probability cube on the right hand side, we can see that there are areas of very high probability. So these will typically, very often they correlate to areas where you've got thinner reservoirs that are actually in or at uh, uh, peak uh, tuning. So of course, when, when intervals are tuned, they actually have higher signal to noise relative to everywhere else uh, in the survey. So. Uh, that's getting exploited by the inversion. But we can see that there is significant 
uh, variability from one uh, to the next. And we need to factor that into any sort of um, uh, you know, reservoir connectivity production type analysis. We get reasonable results across uh, most of the wells. <clears throat> um, and what we tend to see is that the you know, VPVS uncertainty is, is, of course, greatest in areas where we have lower net to gross. So there's lots of different possible vertical configurations that, that will give the same seismic response, but also where uh, we have degraded uh, seismic quality, noise, residual move out uh, and um, multiple. We performed some post-processing of the results to look at the net to gross and uh, volumes. Um, and then after that, we looked at uncertainties um, across the each of the different uh, uh, realizations. Now, as I mentioned earlier on in the in the presentation, the full field um, uh, or, or the, the full field volumes for uh, this particular um, asset range between 4.5 and 5 billion barrels of oil initially in place. Um, and <clears throat> what we would see uh, from the FACES inversion from uh, the full field area, and this is not the uh, fluid inversion, this is just the tank of sand uh, that's implied from the combination of the oil plus water bearing facies above the contact, is that we get to about 4.7 billion barrels uh, of oil in place, assuming some fairly simplistic uh, averages for reservoir properties and uh, uh, other engineering factors. But when we go and look much more closely at the um, echo area range of volumetrics, and we calculate uh, the P10 through to P90, so that's the probability of exceedance, what we see is that we get a range of possible in-place volumes from 440 up to 1.2 uh, billion barrels. So these are very plausible uh, ranges of oil initially in place for that region of the field. But let's now look at some of the uncertainty and what's driving some of, of these changes. Now what you see uh, on, on, on these plots is that particularly on the net to gross plot on the left hand side, we have large steps in the, um, in, in, in the results. Well, those big steps come from um, some of the main uh, prior proportion parameter changes. So it's telling you that um, <clears throat> there's considerable sort of uncertainty uh, in, 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 in that uh, property. But also we're seeing some significant changes um, in net gross, which are actually driven by the fact that um, there is a very strong um, relationship or, or, or comparison between the impedance of oil bearing reservoir uh, and the reservoir shale. So small changes in the net gross prior result in quite sudden changes uh, between oil and shale, and that's driven by the fact that, that those two faces have the same or very similar acoustic impedance. So that's a useful um, outcome of the um, analysis. If we compare the results of a single simultaneous inversion result followed by Bayesian classification and uh, the multi-scenario approach on the right-hand side, we also see some significant uh, differences. Now, the low frequency model that was built for the case on the left hand side um, was built using geostatistics and interpolation of the well data. And in this particular case, uh, the person that interpolated the uh, well log data didn't really take care or think too, too much about the fact that some of the wells um, have a hydrocarbon response uh, and others uh, don't. So when we interpolate those wells, we're in fact interpolating a hydrocarbon response down the flank of the structure and potentially beyond the limit of um, where, where the hydrocarbons should be. So this is a bias that's built into the model. And regardless of the fact that the, low, uh, that the column might only be 10 to 20 milliseconds thick, uh, 
it will still have an impact on the low frequency model um, after you've applied uh, the, the, the filtering. Because of all of this averaging um, and, and, and the averaging that happens during the low pass filtering of the model, we also limit ourselves, particularly in areas where we've got low um, net to gross, because again, we have similarity in the uh, acoustic impedance between shale and oil reservoir, but, but, but we've got a fixed starting point. So the inversion can't start more to, to one side or, or the other side of the impedance spectrum. So we end up just with a, a result that says there's, there's not very much oil at that location. Because the fact that the facies inversion has no um, starting low frequency model per se, it can switch very quickly between a sand or a shale uh, or other corresponding mythologies. And so we actually start to get a much more robust image and representation of the range of possibilities in the subsurface. So we do see now we've got some high probability of oil sitting at the crestal part of the structure. We don't see oil below where we know the contact is. And we have uh, the benefit of um, the standard deviation property, which is, is, is showing and potentially suggesting to us that there might be some error in, in the way that that horizon was picked. Why do we have such high standard deviations there? Well, it's partly because we're switching between uh, one, one layer which is, is only one facies and another layer which could be any number of, of, of three uh, other facies. So a much uh, more robust image of uncertainty. Looking through very quickly at uh, some of the other um, outputs, we can calculate ISO probability surfaces, hydrocarbon column thickness maps at different probability levels. And of course, this is taking all of that information across uh, different um, uh, the different realizations, and these, of course, you can see actually correlate quite high highly to uh, the uh, drilled uh, production uh, well locations. So um, that suggests that, that, that the uh, field development has been uh, performed in in a in a robust manner, targeting the highest um, uh, areas of, of certainty. If we look at the Elastic properties on a slice just below the top of the reservoir. We have the mean impedance, uh, we have the mean VPVS ratio, and the P50 uh, net to gross. Now, what we'll also have is our most likely facies map. But just because we have this facies map doesn't mean that we could plop a well anywhere across that structure and have a good uh, result. This result needs to be um, interpreted alongside the uncertainties. And when we look at, for example, the VPVS uncertainty, we see the yellow areas have a high degree of uncertainty. And that's being driven by um, noise in the seismic data, by things like misalignment, uh, residual move out, uh, multiple, but also uh, some of the geological factors, such as you know, perhaps there are uh, areas of, of lower net to gross. Um, so all of these volumes should be interpreted side by side. So just to conclude, um, what I've hopefully demonstrated is that as part of the reservoir characterization process, low frequency models represent a significant source of uncertainty. They're completely or very highly non-unique. They require a lot of effort to construct and to do it properly, you need to work with the experts to put in that, that deliberate bias into the low frequency models so that you come out with plausible uh, ranges of um, uncertainties. What we've proposed in, in this presentation is, is the adoption uh, and application of a multi-scenario um, inversion approach. It doesn't use the low frequency model in the conventional sense. And so it means that uh, your subsurface team uh, can work together to identify a much broader range of possible uh, geological uh, and geophysical um, scenarios that can then be tested quickly and easily and taken forward into a probabilistic um, analysis. So with that, I'd like to uh, close and thank you very much for listening to this presentation. <laughs>